Welcome everyone uh, back with another hunter man video uh, Disclaimer again Nothing intended for legal purposes. This is all history information experience from the past and uh, once again, I'd like to Welcome my friend and colleague hunter man. How you doing hunter man? I'm good. How are you? Good good this video here is going to be called more or less. Sometimes more is yeah, less, I, and uh, sometimes less is more. So, yeah, I, I I thought you know that would be an inter interesting topic because you know sometimes uh, as people are getting into conditioning these dogs, uh, they always wonder uh, how do I start, when do I start, um, what is good, more or less. Everything always comes down to somehow with the meaning of more or less, you know, it's always been a big misunderstood issue because people don't know how far to go, when to stop, uh, you know, is more good or is less better. Uh, but yet in, in, in contrast to that discussion is basically that everything that we do coincides with the both on both sides of the issue has good points and it has its bad bad points on both sides on the more side and then the less side right including feed you know how much to feed yeah. how much is too much how much is you know with me it's always been <clears throat> the weight how the weight uh you know uh if you're coming down in weight you know should be incre incrementally and uh you know where you start at what weight are you starting uh with a particular dog in mind you know so uh, yeah. with with that, let's Definitely. talk about how uh, how feed and supplements affect the dog. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with more. You know, the the majority of today's dog men uh, tend to not actually measure the food. Sometimes people tend to eyeball things, you know, and not knowing if the amount that actually they're giving is going to be the proper amount with the feed and is the feed actually going to go coexist with their program and is that the right type of particular food that you're feeding these dogs. You know, we always tend to give more in that sense, especially even with the supplements, you know. Everybody buys supplements, they really don't measure it at times and they just add more because the word more seems to be a confident stage for them knowing that if they gave them more, they're ahead of the game. But um, I'm sure you, you know, you see this from time to time, schoolboy, that the drawback with more sometimes doesn't allow the animal to digest that particular amount of food you're feeding them. And it offsets the enzymes in the pancreas, so the dog has trouble um, actually digesting that food at a certain time rate, which I will always call the word time factor, at a certain time factor. So, you know, it, it'll offset the time of your workload. Uh, and everything and it also fluctuates their weight with that in that same situation feeding supplements is very tricky you know we don't need to uh, start with more all the time you know we need to figure out exactly that the amount that we're giving them is going to stabilize that dog to that certain you know weight so what, do we, what will be the good rule of thumb to start with you know uh, on that particular feeding so as as, as we're talking about this topic more, we see that the issues of people are basically is the advancements of too much of something. But sometimes in conditioning, it causes a major confusion to know exactly where do we start for and how much cups. What do you think in, on that situation, schoolboy? Uh, as far as the feed, let's start with the feed ratio. With the food, you know, feeding this dog on a certain amount of cups, what would be the best bet to start with? Yeah, with me, it was, you know, I had, uh, I fed them a certain amount daily feed, right? And then, and this is just the eyeball because, you know, every dog's different. Could be less, could be more. So when I put them in keep, all I did was give them more uh, food as far as real food. Whatever kind of meat you're using, fat like that, carbs, whatever, right? So my rule of thumb for a dog in keep, percentage-wise, was between... Uh, 28 and 30 percent protein uh, 18 to 20 percent fat 5 to 10 percent carbs and then everything else is the supplements and moisture and all that right so uh, 
taking that daily feed well how much is that you know how much are you you know the percentage especially like on dog food the percentage is there's a way to measure them right because there's there's so much in in the food so many other things like meat is just not it's not just straight protein there's it's iron it's it's magnesium you know it, there's fat in there all this stuff right so my simple measure was i'm feeding about 25 percent more during keep than i am during uh you know just on the chain just daily feed right so with my with my regular feed if it's a dog that i was competing with depending on the weight of the dog the size of the dog I had them anywhere between two pounds and four pounds above their weight. So a smaller dog, two pounds, bigger dog, you know, four, 45 to 50 pound dog, about four pounds, maybe a little more over their weight, right? And that, that was a steady weight. They kept that weight all the time. It didn't fluctuate too much. And then I, in keep, I would increase it, you know, like that. And, uh, and then uh, uh, because I'm putting more work into them, harder work and all that stuff. So that was kind of my measure for for how much, you know. That's that's a excellent, excellent way to put it. And that's what everybody should really, really closely listen to. That is extremely important, especially what you just mentioned. And I'll keep it on a, on a little bit earlier basic system on that too as well. Okay. First, you know, when we start in this first feed program and you've got your food down pack or what you're going to use, you figure you've got your supplements down packed on, on what you're going to use in a certain amount. Let's start with the first initial feeding, you know. I like to start a dog with the first uh, one cup and a half to two cups of dog food as, you know, when we start with the kibble, as the first initial startup system. And the reason for that is because I need to find out uh, – the properties in that particular kibble that we're giving them, how does it react to the first initial eight ounce cup of dog food? You know, the first eight ounce uh, cup of dog food initially becomes two cups of dog food in reality because once water is added or once this food enters the dog's uh, pancreas and digestive system it, and it absorbs a lot of the water and moisture that's in the system, it expands. Now, the funny thing is with dog food in a lot of kibbles is that there is different expansion levels on the based on how the food was compressed and exactly. the type of properties that the food contains. So if you gave a dog a cup of an eight ounce cup of dog food and that expanded well beyond uh, its amount, it usually would be confirmed as two cups of dog food when you weigh it because it expands its wider, it's more. Right. Uh, this also changes the dog's digestive system to decide how much it's going to make and and you know and digest you know, with his enzymes and stuff like that. But when we get back to this is that once you start with that and also keep in mind that any time you start with a, a, with a simple measurement of food, as you increase a, a quarter more or, or half a cup more, you're going to see the rise of the change of uh, body weight. You can either gain a half a pound or a pound or a pound and a half or two pounds. The question is that every dog is so different that their weight distribution and increases is actually not the same, even for the same amount of cup of food. So the question is, that dog that you just worked and that dog you just fed, when he ate this, how much did he weigh with a full belly of food that you fed him with? And then, you know, as you, you know, work him out, you're going to see the fluctuation of weight. So did, did that eight ounce a cup of food increase the weight or did it stabilize it exactly where the weight is, was initially at? So if that weight is initially at, let's say, uh, let's say he's 50 pounds and you fed him to eight ounce, so he's 51 or 50 and a half. If he stays there directly, then you know that that was the good initial startup. But if he starts to put up weight a little too fast, then you have to look at your program and say, okay, so I'm conditioning for six weeks. I have a pound of body weight of a weight to take off per week. So if I add this and it gave me a half a pound to a pound more than normal, that means in each edition of the week, the weight increases. You don't want that. So you might have to take off a little just to stabilize them so that when you start this program and you work them, that weight is going to be on slowly. And if you need to increase it, then you can add a quarter or a half a cup.
up or whatever you desire to do so, yeah, but you'll know that within a day or two, how fast, or three days, how fast would you put on a half a pound to a pound of body weight, how much time do you have in your conditioning in the teeth to coincide with the timing of the, the advancement of, of weight distribution to the time of your schedule. So everything sometimes, as we say, would have to go hand in hand because this confuses a lot of guys. Guys give dogs food and then all of a sudden they the weight is going up, then they cut the food and then they know all of a sudden there's leaves dropping too fast and they add more food. And now you kind of like disrupt the whole balance of a dog's uh, digestive system and the balance of your timing of this animal and the feeding the proper amount. Because also, you know, when we feed, even if I set a dog evenly and, and the weight is, you know, stabilized, every time you work him, he's going to lose a half a pound naturally. So a pound of body weight as you work out. Then we need to gain that back. This is what we call fluctuation weight. It's distribution of weight that bounces up and down periodically. But people not to get alarmed by that. But the fact that you need to know exactly when is the end game of that particular weight, which means at the end of the week, where we can stabilize that. Did he actually drop down too far? Sometimes it can happen earlier, a day, two days, two days later, earlier after this, or it can at, at the end of the week. But either or. We can't say that this is exactly when it's going to happen because each animal is an individual animal and must be studying a colony, and their balances are always various. So measurement of food as well as the, the amount of supplements to give. And when we go back to the supplement, uh, schoolboy, as you and I already understood with that, sometimes too much supplements daily and not stretched out in different days and numbers uh, becomes an overload of too much supplements in the system becomes, I call it collagenated, means it becomes clogged with too much. It's, he's getting supplements, but yet he hasn't digested from the day before. This creates an overheating problem in the system. What do you think, Google? Yep, you're right. That's good, good info. And, you know, with me, the, the, uh, when I wanted to increase or decrease food, whichever one, the, that was where the kibble came in. Because to me, the kibble has kind of everything in it, right? It's got the protein, fat, all the minerals, trace elements, iron, all that stuff in it. So it's kind of like a balanced meal. So for me to adjust the kibble was a lot easier than, uh, let's say, I adjust the protein or I have to adjust the fat or I have to adjust the supplements, you know, or or something like that. It just made it easier. It's a It's a balanced diet in the kibble. So... Uh, you know, that's, that's what I used if I had to adjust my food and you're right, especially the, the last week, that's where people panic and start adjusting the food and the moisture and the up and down because, you know, they're worried about making weight. And, and, uh, like you said, you have to, you know, early in the keep, that's where you have to get the feed down pat. Once you have the feed down pat, if there's any adjustments, it's just a little bit, like you said, it may be a half a cup of kibble, you know? give or take away depending on which one and then once you get the food down and that's another point you made people they don't measure they kind of eyeball it or you know let's say you're using a spoon or whatever for for a supplement if you don't top the spoon off then you know when you reach in and grab a spoonful sometimes you're giving them more one day you're giving them more one day you give them a little less it's not even so they have to be somewhat exact you know, same thing with a kibble. If you just reach in with a cup and, and grab the kibble, you know, and and uh, uh, give it to them, well, it might be overflowing a little bit. There might be a hump, you know, you're giving them more. The other next day, it might be level, sometimes a little less. So measuring everything accurately, I think, is important because that'll keep everything straight. Whereas the other way, now you're going to see a fluctuation that's not really a fluctuation in how you're conditioning the dog, it's a fluctuation because you're not measuring the food or and supplements you're giving them accurately. So, man, that was Perfect. some good well, stuff so, you gave. So that's so, ladies and gentlemen, that is what we call the more of. Now, let's talk about the less, which is also I always nickname it the collateral effect. And the reason for that is when people don't give enough of proteins enough of supplements or a certain amount and they undercut themselves to the point 
that they're adding so much of other stuff, but they're not adding the proper amount, as schoolboy discussed. Uh, this causes a lot of major problems, and one of the major problems is that the muscles and the tissues and the blood red blood cells are not getting enough uh, fuel to sustain itself, enough oxygen, because of certain amount of properties that are in the system. Sometimes the lack of something, the dog see has to work harder. The heart will increase more, the blood will flow harder, the body temperature rises because it's trying to get more of the nutrients that it's required for, but because it's lacking of that, the body starts to change. And this causes that, what we call the great catabolistic effect. And what that means is that because certain, sometimes too less of something or too much of something the body shuts down and it starts to eat its own muscleless fuel to retain itself. Right. And that only happens for two reasons. One is because if there's too much of something or some, or if there's too much or less of something, you know, if there's not enough of it, right. You know, uh, the proper hydration and, and everything that goes into a keep has to be there 24 hours. You know, I seen a lot of conditions, uh, schoolboy where, they're working a dog, and I looked at the cage, and I didn't see enough water in the water bowl. Um, many times, the rest periods were not long enough. You know, they would they rest them uh, one day, and they went back to work, and your dog only had one day off on the key for rest. Um, a lot of the stuff that they fed, they didn't feed enough. You know, they were so worried about trying to not gain weight that they kept this dog starved. Or starve or, or underfed to us to 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 keep themselves maintained at that weight, thinking that if I could keep my dog a half a pound under, by the time I get to the end of the keep, guess what? I'm gonna be light. I'll make my weight and blah blah blah. But in right. reality, you're not only a half a pound to a pound or two pounds under, but just think in 20, 30 minutes of their endurance contest, the dog's already gonna lose another pound of body weight or a pound and a half. Yeah. So you're talking about handicapping an animal anywhere from up to three pounds yep. because of that particular reason. You know, guys and ladies and gentlemen, you know, as you're listening to this, you know, think about making sure that you don't underfeed these dogs as well as overfeed these dogs. You need to get it right. This is why when you set up your feed program, you check the dog and see how he's feeling, how much he's eating. And then once you balance yourself out where he's getting enough, and he's not getting too less, then you can start moving on forward to make some adjustments as you go along through your keep. So if going forward and he drops a half a pound too soon before the week is over, then you know you might need to add a quarter or you or an eighth of, of, of whatever it is. It could be supplements. It can be the feed. It could be – that's why when you write it down, you can check uh, where – if you, any problems arise, you can check on that keep and say, okay, was it the feed problem? Was it a supplemental problem? Or was it overworking that caused the, pro the, the more or less factor problem with this dog? It was that the, it was the overworking dictating the, and the stress dictating what's going on of his program of his nutrient supplements and feed? What do you think, Scooboy? Yep, yep. That's a good point. All them points. Now, <clears throat> you know, when you're, when you're talking about rest days, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, well, I give them two, three days a week rest, you know, and, and the dog still seems tired, you know. And I tell them, well, you know, where do you keep the dog, where this and that? If they have him out in the yard with the other dogs, a dog in key, he's not resting, you know. Because any little thing, especially when you work them more and they start coming to pee, anything sets them off. So it's important, that's one of the reasons where the word keep comes in, you know, you're keeping them in solitude you're keeping them away from distractions so when they're asleep or they're not around they go work during the day the dog's actually active during the day if he's not put up so they're burning all this all these calories the the person doesn't realize it and even though they give them days off the dog is not actually resting uh the other thing is you know uh that's what it is they're they're you're feeding them a certain amount of calories. And people can, you can calorie count and all that stuff. They're, you're feeding them a certain... They need a certain amount of calories. Because they're going to burn them during the day. They're going to burn them when they do their workout. If you're not replacing all those, 
that's where you get into that like starvation thing where the body starts eating against itself. It doesn't have enough nutrients to make up for the exercise that you put them through. They burn that plus more. If, if you don't give them enough, they're going to burn whatever calories they had in the food you gave them plus more, which is that eating at itself, you know. And that's where you get dogs tired and listless, you know. And uh, not focused in their workout, you know. You may think you're feeding them enough, but it may not be enough. Because, uh, you know, on one hand, we have people that, you know, feed them too much. On the other hand, you have people that that uh, uh, don't feed them enough. I've had people tell me, you know, it's just, you know, during the keep, I'm only giving them like a handful of food total, you know. that ju That just isn't enough. Even if it's good stuff, good meat, good food, good kibble, the volume itself is not enough. And that's where I think people run into problems. So either one is just as important. You can feed too much, you can give too many supplements, or you can not feed enough. You know, they need food. You can double up on the supplements, and if you're not giving them enough food, doubling up on the supplement really doesn't don't matter it doesn't doesn't have the effect you think exactly. it, it will you know so well said yeah and before we go on to the next one uh i just want to emphasize one thing uh ladies and gentlemen is that the fact that you can take five dogs at the equal weight let's say all five or 50 pounds do you know that every 55 pound dog within the five dogs that are standing in front of me not one of their each of not put it this way each dog their calorie intake is actually different. Yeah. Even though they're all 50 pound dogs. Yep. Each dog's uh, body will assume a certain amount of calories. No dog is the same. So, what I'm getting to is don't assume because you fed a 50 pound dog a certain amount that that is required for the next one. Every dog's calorie system and, and what they burn in their intake system is all different altogether. That's why you have to study this animal. And make sure that what you're giving this particular dog is the correct amount, not what you give every other dog that you assume is correct. Because what you assume is correct is not correct because you're not studying the individual animal. Follow me? Yep, exactly. Not every 50 pound, whatever weight it is, they all don't require exactly. the same amount of food. And that'll kind of, we'll kind of get into that too in this next one. Uh, uh, fast pace versus slower pace. So fast pace, you know, they blow, they can blow hot. Slower pace, they can control their heart rate better. So talk a little bit about fast paced dogs and slower paced dogs. Wow, this is uh, one of the most uh, talked about and most controversial topics uh, most people will ever really truly understand because we live in a generation that we're only taught what, we are taught because many of us become one track minded and only a few can become open minded to all different obstacles. So when we talk about fast paces, fast pace more better. Okay, let's look at the good side of that. And then we're going to look at the bad side of, of that. Okay, of the more, once again. So is fast pace good? Fast pace is great when you need to get the dog uh, aerobics moving to increase the heart rate at a faster rate, um, to develop his uh, speed, um, to, you know, get the most out of him, you know, to a certain point and a certain degree. Uh, it has its good points and its bad points. Um, to me, the bad points is that when you go fast, the less is to me is, is, is truly more important than more. And people say, why? You need to work a dog hard, Hunter. You need to get more out of him, Hunter. But the fact is that our team were winning more because we took the time to let the animal adjust to these uh, stressful times and, and, and the climatical changes within their own bodies. Um, you allow them to set the pace in their heart, allow the blood pressure to be reduced on their own based on the oxygen volume that the animals absorb into his system. Um, I always was a fancier of the slow world because I seem to go the distance better and I seem to have a, an animal that can climb 
that brick wall when they hit that you know wall and, and and during an endurance contest that they have to recover at a shorter amount of time where a fast-paced dog because he's looking to get it done his recovery time was actually too fast he didn't have a chance to adjust himself so a slower paced animal to me has a better chance of development from his ligaments to his cartilages and his legs his body his lungs learn to absorb and actually inhale a certain amount of oxygen for each stage of stress so in other words if you got a dog pacing at 13 miles an hour he might take let's say a certain amount of volumes of oxygen maybe like let's say five or six percent uh, uh what we call an air mass then considering as time went by at a slow pace he was able to absorb 20 percent and yet now that 13 mile an hour pace went to 15 16 miles an hour and he could go up more air and still his heart rate will be no less than a couple of beats of a difference of shorter so in other words instead of pounding his heart is pounding because he's racing and, ex and and to the point of exhaustion his heart was actually pumping like a normal dog at the highest rate of stress level there was a big gap and a big difference on that yeah. and um when we realized that we realized that not only did the heart rate was learning to control the volume of oxygen and stuff like that but it was also the blood pressure uh dropped a little bit where it wasn't too high and his heat temperature in his body also regulated itself from 100 see the average was with 103 104 degrees but when they work out you can go 104 105 up to 106 or 7 but just think at a fast-paced dog would probably be banging 107 108 too soon too early so now he didn't have a chance to calibrate his breathing he might be doing more than the, the slower paced dog yeah but then in reality, he's not getting enough volume and pacing himself and, and of oxygen to his system and controlling everything that's going around him. He's just looking to get it over with. And just think about it. If you went to a contest, would you want him to try to think he can get it over with and burn himself out and then he can't last, if, you know, for the long haul? Now, if you meet an, a, 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 another performing animal that can go the endurance for over an hour, two hours, he can be a lesser quality of than your dog is, but because he has the stamina to go the distance and he carries your thoroughbred that's running 100 miles an hour to the distance, you run out of fuel. And guess what? He could be a lesser of the dog and be the better winner because he actually, your dog burnt himself out and he couldn't keep up with the pace. Right. So. What's your take on some of this before I go into any more details, Boo Boy? Because this yeah. is a kind of a, like a really serious issue that people tend to not understand, you know. And yeah. I've seen too many people overwork dogs. Yeah, I uh, I put it like this: it's kind of like the RPMs on a vehicle. You step on the gas, you know, you're you're at a standstill. You step on the gas, our the RPMs shut shoot up, oh, like that. Now you hold that gas pedal the same as when you started. Once the engine catches up, the RPMs drop. You're still going fast. You still flooring the gas, but the RPMs have dropped. And that's kind of how I wanted the dogs to be. Work at a good place, but they're controlling their heart rate. They're controlling their breathing. And what happens with those fast paced dogs, you know, Sometimes they get it done early. That's that's fine. But if they can't, like you said, they don't have enough to recuperate on the fly. And then they blow hot. They they never recuperate. I had a, a friend of mine, you know, he was working a dog. And it was a female. She had great air, right? But he would tell me in the keep, he go, Richard, you know, schoolboy, she don't, she don't, you know, I'm trying to bait her. I'm trying to get her you know, to move faster, to work harder, this and that. And I said, don't. Stop. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, but she just hits a pace and she stays at that steady pace. I said, that's good. She knows what she's doing. I mean, if she has great air, like you say, how much air are you going to increase in her? She really don't need that. She's smart enough to know that this is her pace. I said, leave her alone. Don't bait her. Don't try and force her. Don't push her. To work harder. 
let her let her work her own pace. And I said, I bet you this, as you progress through the keep, or maybe she gets past this one and you do another keep, she'll pick up the pace on her own. She'll she'll pick up, you know, when she feels comfortable picking it up on her own, you know. And that's what happened. He backed off, stopped debating her, and then she just hit that pace. She did good. She won. Next keep, he did her again. He goes, yeah, yeah, schoolboy, you're right. You know, she's working a little better now, a little faster pace, this and that. I say, yeah, the dogs are smarter than us. And this is why a lot of times, you know, when people send me vids or this and that, they're constantly baiting the dog. They're constantly pushing the dog because in people's minds, they think you got to work hard. You got to push them, push them, push them. It throws them all off. They can't keep that pace. They don't have enough oxygen intake. So a lot of times, if you just leave the dog alone and let him work his pace, it's better. If you push him to work when, when you shouldn't, even a naturally aired dog that has good air like that, you'll, you'll screw him up. You know, you can mess him up. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like, um, I mean, I have to go back into time, you know, in the history books for this. You know, uh, Mr. Bill had a dog named Nikki. She went four and a half hours. So when you say, they say, okay, she went four and a half hours, most dog men would say, okay, she's a game dog, but it took her four and a half hours. The reality is that the, the opposite that went with that time, it was the better condition dog that actually won. Hmm. But sometimes when you get two dogs of equal gamenesses with the same ability, it's usually the better condition dog that's going to win. Yep. You know? Sometimes, you know, we all got this uh, fame and glory about the fast pace, quick in and out of. And then the reality of it is you can be, if your dog cannot get it done within that certain amount of time, just face the reality of it. Your ass is being handed to you, even with a lesser dog. Gameness is the essence of all. And conditioning for that, regardless if you're a fast pace or regardless if you're a, a well-paced animal, Conditioning plays a major part in both parties. And if you're going to condition for a super fast pace uh, individual, expect your time short order that's going to be quick. You're going to really realize that your conditioning is not being effect effective at all. Because if someone or some animal pulls that opposite of that, you know, contestant to the distance, you're going to see what conditioning is all about. I remember and recall and uh, seeing a party and people would say, oh, what a man, look at that. That's a beast. She's 900. Yo, you can't stop her. She's, she is a total machine. And I looked over to a buddy of mine and I said to him at the time, how much you got in your pocket? He says, oh, I got like five. I says, okay, so I bet you $5. Guess what? She ain't gonna last thirty minutes. <laughs> and she bagged out in thirty minutes. Yeah. And people say, How the hell she was she was doing great. She was the top, you know, it wasn't that. It's just the sadness was that the conditioning I saw, I didn't see a lesser dog. What I saw was a unproperly conditioned animal. Right. And I saw the signs of struggle within the dog's eyes, his mouth foaming, certain situations, legs shaking, tail down low, uh, there was tail time signs that to told me exactly that this dog heart was a beast, but his body could not keep up with what the dog was. Yeah. So when you say fast and more, do we really, and like Scooboy mentioned, even in the car scene, do you really want to accelerate so fast and not be able to win top end? Or do you want to win top end and not worry that you have to push so hard in the beginning? That's the question. The conditioning of more or less is so, so important because sometimes we work a dog and we're not confident enough. We think that because we did a little bit of something, it's not enough and not sufficient enough for this animal. We think that this animal is not going to be conditioned. But how is it that when we work a dog 25 minutes, 30 minutes a day, proper feed, proper rest, and we get four hours, two hours, and never, ever ran out of gas until after the old, old hour mark before yep. the dog even shows signs of just getting a little warmed up or even hot. Yeah, I'd rather be over the hour mark than to be under 20 minutes like the average 
uh, dogs today. Yeah. So when you're conditioning for that, ask yourself, is the dog truly properly conditioned? You might not, you might think that the more is going to be the best, but in fact, it takes so much out of your animal that you'll have nothing in the gas tank, even in a race car. Exactly. And you know, when, when I use words like distance, this and that, it, it doesn't, it doesn't mean two, three, it doesn't have to mean two, three, four hours like that. What happens when, when you screw these keeps up and the dog isn't conditioned properly, it's usually within 30 to 45 minutes, they're done. They can't even do that. So you may be okay under the 30 minute mark if you have a monster or you have, uh, you know, some killer or whatever, you know, speaking of the past, but uh, it's not, it's not like what people think where oh they're gonna they're gonna go an hour and you know that's a long time and this whatever whatever they think this this breakdown of conditioning or having a dog ill prepared it doesn't take too long you see it you could see it in five minutes you could see it in 15 minutes by 30 minutes they run hot they don't recuperate and by 45 minutes if they can go that long they're they they lose they're finished you know, right. the, so, people have this, you know, I want them to go 100 miles an hour. It's okay. Go 100 miles an hour for a few minutes. Then recoup. Then go 100 miles an hour for another couple of minutes and recoup. Because that's the way a show goes. It goes back and forth like that. Whatever the pace is, it comes out usually starting faster. Then it slows down, picks up, slows down, picks up. Whatever the time limit of that show was, that's how it goes. There ain't no athlete, no dog that can go a hundred miles an hour forever, you know, and that's why I uh, advise people: don't don't push your dogs, you know. Don't they they constantly talking to them, constantly pushing them, waving a toy in front of them, or and, and they do this a lot of times at the beginning of the keep when the dog is heavy. That's just causing more injury to the dog, you know, and it's a constant bait, constant bait, constant bait. They, even if you do that for five minutes, if the dog is heavy, you could hurt him doing that, you know? Oh, my God. So true. Yeah, I've seen that so many times, you know. How are you going to work a dog when he's so heavy, so hard? Doesn't he have to uh, drop a certain amount of body weight in order to move on further? Right. So if that's going to be the case, you want to go slow. And then as he drops the body weight, then you increase the workout. Like that. And not only he can go further, but he's capable of going further without destroying himself, his ligaments, his body, his mindset, and and especially to the point of exhaustion. Yep. Uh, that was one of the key points that Schoolboy just made, which is so, so important. Um, people need to pay attention to that. You know, you you can't take a fat guy and put him on the treadmill and run him 900 miles an hour. He'll take him out the hog guy. Yeah, Is exactly. that what you want to do to your dog? Yeah. I mean, let's talk about this seriously because we're all conditioning. But there are few who really pay attention to the details because it makes a big difference, not only mentally and physically to the animal, but it makes a difference between winning and losing and doing what is right for the dog. You know, we don't want to steer people in the wrong direction, but we want to explain to you the more or less of this situation and topics that we are addressing today because there are a lot of problems people face and they still can't seem to fix that situation unless we bring certain things to the air that maybe they can look back and address there on their go. program and say okay maybe i did this wrong maybe i gotta add this maybe i gotta subtract this maybe i gotta reduce the weight but last and uh last on this particular topic i want to address too the rise and fall of humidity changes everything in the animal, meaning sometimes the way we condition between winter, fall, summer, spring is different, okay? Animals burn certain amount of calories faster in a different temperature barometer, as they would say. Why you think in winter conditioning is so different compared to the hot 90-degree summers or in different ranges in fall and spring? Think about dogs from Canada in the ice-cold Arctic weather to the dogs in Brazil in 90 to 100 degree weather daily, these dogs' bodies have adjusted to these climate climates and changes 
in their system, their body, their, it actually embeds into their genetics to their pups because they are raised in that environment. You know, it's like you taking a Canadian animal and bringing him to Brazil and see how he performs compared to a dog from Brazil and bring him to Canada and he can't even break skin on a, on a rock solid dog that's used to dealing with ice conditions. You know, um, temperature, the year, and everything also affects this change in more or less in conditioning with the fast pace. Yep, definitely, definitely. Especially, you know, hot, humid weather. <clears throat> the the guys I know and, and you know, uh, where I live, it's it's hot and dry. It's not really hot and humid, but it's still, it, it could be a burning heat, you know. But in the humid places, they tend to have them a little bit thinner, right, on the thinner side. Because when it's humid, there's moisture in the air. So if you bring them in too wet in the humid weather, they're going to breathe in more moisture right yes, and and exactly. a lot of times that's why they don't do a lot of damage because they're taking in they're breathing in the air through their mouth so they can't really close their mouth all the way right so that's one of the reasons they bring them in they bring them in lighter but yeah all that should be taken into consideration and and when you're working a dog whatever conditions you're working them in you'll notice that hey i have to do something different in the spring than i did in the fall or I have to do something different in the warm weather than I did in the cold weather. Maybe in the cold weather you can work them for a longer period of time or do a little bit harder workout where in the hotter weather you, you don't have to work them so hard because they'll, they heat up faster. So, and you have to remember the dogs are, if it's regular pit bulls, you know, they're natural athletes. So they're active, even some of mine, in the middle of summer, 110 degrees, they'd be out there digging holes and running around. So I had to have a lot of shade for them, and I used to go out and uh, spray their area to cool it down. Now, when I did that, it cooled the area down for a little bit, but it also raises the humidity, right? So I would have to do that three or four times a day, right, and make sure they have plenty of water and, and plenty of shade, those type of dogs, their whole area during the day in the summertime had to be shaded because if not, they would kill us so they get heat stroke, you know. So all that temperature and all that needs to be taken in consideration. And then, uh, you know, if you're traveling a long distance, you might want to, you know, get the forecast on where you're going or at least be familiar with what the temperatures are like there, you know. So, yeah, that's good stuff. Exactly. Well yeah. said. Well said. Yeah. Next one is the contrast between, uh, you know, a short dog versus a tall dog. Short dog versus the tall dog. To me, the contrast with that is based on how do we condition a shorter dog for a long haul and a long, taller dog that has more ability to go further to have more punch and relax. Uh, because usually a longer dog, it depends on the situation of the animal's uh, prey drive I would call that but yeah conditioning uh, on a short dog for more uh, it's a little tough because his pace is not as long he is shorter so his stride is shorter so the bottom line is he's taking more steps and more running ability than the average dog so he was working 10 times harder a shorter animal works 10 times harder than a long rangier animal because his stride is short and he has to make double steps for the one step stride of a longer range of dog right so when we work a dog like that or condition an animal to, to that extent we have to pay attention to the time and how how much do we work a dog so even though he has to take two or three steps shorter maybe we may have to work him a little slower to get more longer uh, distance from him because he's a shorter broad broad dog with short thick legs he doesn't have that endurance uh, genetic trait in his body. That's, he's not designed for, like, long distance. He's more of a powerhouse, like a little power train. You know, he right. can push, drive. So what can we do to benefit is gaining his strength levels, but we have to still, in the same order, is to increase the oxygen levels and but retain more strength. But... Remember one thing, where there is strength, there is muscle. And where there is more muscle, there is more mass. 
including body weight and weight distribution on the leg. So because he's a shorter build, he's more muscular, he tends to have uh, carry more uh, weight structure to his body. He's not as mobile as would be a longer range of dog as far as dancing for a long period of time. He can get the job done. He's an excellent animal. But his whole conditioning must be taken very, very carefully and a lot of consideration to what is needed for this particular animal. Am I going to use a lot of road work, uh, whether it's chain pulling, weight pulling, carpet mill? Uh, what can we utilize for this dog to get more out of him because he's a short, smaller animal or short, broader dog with a lot of weight? Um, his legs are not long. So his whole gait analysis is way off the margin compared to that of a rangy dog. And then when we go to the rangy dog, you know, we know he gets a stride. And we know he's got the air. But the problem with him is he's too fast. So sometimes some rangy dog, they want to keep going because they have the ability to do so. But do we push them to go that far? Or do we back them off just a little bit right. uh, to let him learn to control that heart rate and the breathing and the oxygen displacement for his brain and his body because of the large volume of stride and everything he can go up 10 times more air he's an endurance animal he's bred for the long haul he's a, like almost like if you're racing a greyhound versus a, a german shepherd this is like what we would consider you know so conditioning that particular animal is going to be a whole different margin the question is this who gets more and who gets less? We know the rangy is more, and we know that the short broad is less. But in reality, the, the short of dog might have to take his time a little bit, but we still have to go further with him. Where the other one can go further, but we might have to take his time to get a little shorter of him, just so that both dogs can equalize their breathing, their heart rate, and their ability to uh, control themselves to the point where they can keep up for that amount of time, distance. The rest is up to them. Their ability plays on their own hands as we were, we're not in control of that. But what, what can we get to make them be able to, you know, perform that they need to perform. So it's kind of tricky, but I'll let you chime on on this. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah, I, I had, uh, you know, a lot of the bully sun dogs are, are built that way, short, squatty, you know. And so... With them, you might want to focus more on strength, right? But mm -hmm. but not bulk. I don't like big, bulky, muscly dog. Even if a dog is built that way, I don't. I didn't. I didn't want them bulky because bulk means you need more oxygen, you need more blood going through your veins, and the extra weight it just it's a detriment. It is not. It doesn't help. It's like a like a bodybuilder. They look great big old muscles but those muscles require more oxygen and it's extra weight so it's actually a detriment you know with some of them they they actually <clears throat> could regulate their breathing that's what helped them not get tired you know and if it's a barnstormer stormer type i tried to, to teach them to pace their self you know which i would back off on the work or I wouldn't encourage them all the time, even if they wanted to work hard, you know. I wouldn't steady, steady encourage them, keep going, keep going, keep going, you know. With the the taller ranger ones, you know, they need strength, you know. And with both, you, you need core strength. And for me, that meant, you know, how I raised them, what I did, build up, you know. That's like their center of gravity. So even if a dog is on the thinner side he could still be a strong dog and for me you know they they can move faster they can they can uh, maneuver better but at the same time like you said they might not pace their self properly you know so there's always a contrast you know the, the taller dog has uh you know has uh uh you know better balance more air you know, uh, better leverage, you know, the shorter one, more powerful, you know, stronger, you know, their center of gravity is lower. But it's all understanding the type of dog that you have, how he moves, how he works, what his style is, talking back in the day, and then you adjust the keep to that, 
to get the benefits out of the dog that that to get the benefits of whatever attributes the dog has itself you know exactly yeah you know getting to the thicker dog you know the small broader dog you know when we talk about that feeds and supplements for these two particular dogs you know um the broader dog tends to have heavier bulks of muscle tissue yeah you know which in turn tend to what we call collapse the vein and what i mean by that it's not that it collapse the vein but what it does it tightens around it so the vein cannot and the arteries cannot expand to a certain amount of criteria to to allow enough oxygen flow at a faster rate right so what i'm trying to get at on that point of view is that with these particular dogs, I like to go on, a, not that I, I'm, I'm into vegan stuff, but because they are heavy and broad with so much muscle mass, I would reduce less protein with them for the simple reason that I would increase the vegan aspect into that so they can get more oxygen capacity and allow the muscles to tend to shrink a little bit and expand the arteries so there's more blood flow. I don't want too much weight on the muscle mass because not only that it causes and creates more injury and insult to the dog during their performance phase, but for the fact that it's going to restrict the blood flow and the oxygen to the dog's body, a body and artery system and everything else. I want to expand those arteries. I want that oxygen flow because if the more oxygen they get on that broader short dog, the longer the performance is going to be. Now, back to the rangy dog. The rangy dog has, for his feed and supplement um, situations, are going to be the fact that because he's a higher energy animal that expands and with, with much more oxygen volume and everything, he has a tendency of burning calories of 10 times more. So maybe his feed should be calibrated up a little bit because his metabolism is at 90 miles an hour. Yeah, it's faster. So he not only he's going to exercise in the keep, but he's able to feed his body a little more because he's burning more. You see, in that sense, of sense now the, he's getting a lot of oxygen through his veins and everything because he's a long range of your So the oxygen wouldn't affect him as much. So maybe this particular long range dog might require more of the protein base than it would be vegan for the simple reason that because he's a high burning energy dog, He's going to require more energy and fuel. And where is your highest point of energy in amino acids and B12s, which is found in your meat source and, and your high protein source? So he might need that to replenish the body for what he's stretching and burning out because of his fast pace there and for go. his distance and endurance. You still want to make sure that he's not too much protein, but he needs enough to repair himself because he's burning so much so fast. Very good points, man. Real good stuff. Next, we have uh, the calibration of blood pressure and its dramatic effects. So what does that mean? Okay, calibrating the blood pressure is knowing how much and when the dog is actually pacing himself. And then checking the blood pressure and the heart rate and everything else that goes with this dog. You know, we ask ourselves many times, you know, when we're working these dogs, why is this dog uh, running hot? I mean, the feed program is dead on. The keep is perfect and everything that's going on, but why is this dog getting hot? Well, there could be a number of reasons between atmospheric temperature changes that create the increase of the heat factor. It can be the amount of enzymes that are being created to digest the food at a faster rate that cause the heat factor. It could be a supplemental problem, not enough, the right amount of supplements. Too much is actually restricting the oxygen flow to the dog's body, which increases the blood pressure and increases a lot of different problems in the dog system because the supplements is, it, it, it's like, uh, how would you say, I, I always use that same crazy word, collagenating, which means like clogging. All the supplements are clogging the blood vessels with so much that there's not enough room for the oxygen to pull up in the red blood cells that it's efficient enough to keep this animal going. Gotcha. So that will increase the dog's heart rate. You know, a dog's uh, blood pressure is 160 over 180 ppm. So when you work a dog, the blood pressure eventually rises. But as the keep progresses in time and your keep actually increases, 
that blood pressure and his body temperature should be dropping. And it, we say, well, where is the drop factor? So if it's 160 over 180 ppm, so 165 or 166, 167 should be sufficient enough to say the dog is actually regulating his own blood pressure. He's not, even if he's working hard or his body is regulating itself, that means he's in control, he's comfortable, the food, everything is coming to a perfect match. But when you got one override the other, he can have great blood pressure, but then all of a sudden his body temperature's rising. Why did that body temperature rise? Mm. You gotta go back and keep, you gotta check the feed, you gotta check the supplement amount. Maybe you need to subtract a certain supplement out of that um, equation in that, in that key. So people don't understand that certain supplements, when given to a dog during a keep, some are kept throughout the whole process of the keep. Some have to be removed during certain weeks of the keep to detoxify the animal, which allows more oxygen flow to the blood and into the brain, which controls the blood pressure, which controls the heart rate. These things can have a very big drastic effect on the dog. But sometimes we say, okay, everything's good. Food's good, keeps good, supplements good. But why is the blood pressure rising? Some dogs got high blood pressure just like people do. Yeah. People don't understand that. Some dogs are anemic. Some dogs are lack of iron. They need more iron in their system. Um, their heart rate increases, but then here we go. We did everything, but we forgot to check the one last issue. What was the temperature of the day? Was it 80 degrees? Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, 65 degrees? Do you know that if it's 95, 85 degrees today, the dog's blood pressure is going to rise and his heart rate is going to rise a little bit? And then yet tomorrow, when it drops down to 65, you get a, actually like a 2 or 3% drop. Mm. And then your dog is like, relax. Why was that? And, and people don't realize that atmospheric temperature changes affects the heart rate and the blood pressure. Very Please good. Please take the next school boy. Yeah, yeah. It'd be like, you know, hey, if it's hot today and cooler tomorrow, today I might do a half workout. Tomorrow I can give them a full workout, you know. Perfect. Like that. Perfect. Yeah, Perfect. yeah. I, uh. It reminds me of uh, this kid who was uh, working his dog, you know, just regular exercise, you know. And I gave him the process, you know, take them out, empty them out, and, you know, you can run them or whatever. And, uh, you know, so he, he did it. After a couple of weeks, the kid's telling me, hey, Richard, he goes, the dog, he he doesn't, you know, he runs hot. He gets, he blows hot all the time, you know. And I said, well, do it at night or early in the morning, you know, so he did that and same thing, you know, dog blowing hot, this and that. And, uh, well, how heavy is he? You know, show me a picture. And the dog looked, he was, uh, you know, had weight on him, but he wasn't fat. You know, he wasn't obese or nothing like that, you know. Finally, I told him, send me your your feed, your keep feed, whatever. What, what are you feeding, you know? He sent it to me, and the one thing I noticed, or the few things I noticed, he's feeding the dog red meat. He's feeding the dog supplementing iron. He's feeding the dog liver. He's giving the dog red cell. He's supplementing B12, and he gives him, he's giving him spinach or, you know, greens, you know, that have iron and all that. And I go, man, take half of that stuff oh, off. You're shit. giving him too much. He was <laughs> overloading the dog, you know. I said, that's why the dog can't, he can't go five minutes without blowing hot, you know. His, I could only imagine. So what you spoke about is something that, that a lot of people don't even think about, William, you know, and that's why I wanted to have you cover that subject that the temperature Shoot. and the blood pressure and all that you know because if like you're saying if the dog is too buck or their veins are restricted and the blood flow isn't going freely throughout the dog uh when when it does what happens when you do them hard workouts like that the circulation is what actually keeps the temperature of the dog down the blood flow through their body and if you're doing it right uh, when you, let's say you take the temperature of the dog uh, before the workout and you take the temperature of the dog after the workout, the temperature yeah. after the workout is a little bit lower. He's actually, his temperature is lower because he's, his body is reacting to that stress, to that work. So it's pumping more blood through his body, which actually cools the body down a little bit. So... That was yep. good stuff you gave. I, that's I good totally agree with that. Yeah, that's good scientific stuff, man.
Yeah, one thing I want to want to say to everybody on this page, you know, me and Schoolboy uh, sit down and sometimes we spend hours heart to heart discussing all these problems. Yes, you know, sir. We sound like scientists, but I just want to make one thing clear. Don't follow the science. Science ain't going to teach you shit, okay? <laughs> you can Google all you want, ain't going to teach you shit. The dog is what's going to teach you. Right. The changes in this animal's presenting in front of your face while you're working them is what we learn and go by, not by what science tells us. Because science puts a blue, basic blueprint based on a dog, not the dog. You right. understand? So the dog you're conditioning has to be understood. If you really, really deeply want to learn, it's not hard. It's not rocket scientist. It's common sense. It's why we can go in this different angles because we did it so many times for everybody. We did it for our dogs. Uh, we're so deeply into this. Uh, so we kind of got used to understanding things. And even as good as me and Schoolboy is, sometimes, you know, we scratch our head and as much as we know, we got to go back to the drawing board and backtrack because every dog teaches us something and poses a new challenge. So this is why we're bringing this topic more or less. Yeah. Next topic. Yeah. Well, we're, we're uh, getting close to the time. So the, there's okay, still, so. there's still some more here, but uh, you know, I just wanted to add to what you just said that, that uh, you know, what, what science does in is it just puts words to, and I noticed this throughout the years. It put wor it puts words or gives explanation for what dog guys already do. They already know what they're doing. It's just that someone with more education can explain what it is. That's the only difference. Because exactly. whether you a scientist or you don't have a lot of education, you have to have hands on with the dog. And what I mean by that is, you know, it it doesn't matter if you don't understand the big words. Or you don't understand this process or that process. It's the results that show you what whether you're doing something right or whether you're doing something wrong. So I'm not, you know, knocking education or learning or anything like that. But it's just in the past, a lot of dog guys, they're just regular people. They weren't heavily educated. But they understood dogs. They understood about temperature they understood about feed and supplements and how to work a dog and how to peak a dog and all that they just don't have the education to put them big words to explain what it is they were doing but you know that that that's kind of uh, my way of telling people you don't have to be you know a college graduate to know this stuff to learn this stuff but you do have to have hands-on experience you do have to have use trial and error to get to the point your results will show you whether you did it right or wrong and if you practice over and over again you'll get it right because anybody can do this stuff you know it's like you know William has done a lot of studying and a lot of you know why does this work what does this mean this and that but he has that hands-on experience that to 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 that he can use you know to explain what it is yeah. he's talking about, you know. It, 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 what I'm saying is, if you if you just read a bunch of books, yeah, you can you can tell people this and you can tell people that. But if you haven't done it, you really don't have the experience to explain, you know, what it is you're doing. And that's the difference, William. You you give a lot of, you know, so-called scientific explanations, but you have that hands-on experience to back it up. That that matters a lot. That's the most, you know. You've actually done a I, ton of dogs, you I, know. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that, you know, but in reality, I'm no science. I'd never finished school, let's yeah, be honest. Yeah. I'm honest to admit that. Yeah. Everything I learned on the field was hands-on. You know, I speak scientifically because I understand both worlds, but in reality, it does, scientific doesn't teach you shit, like as I stated before. You know, I, I've always wanted to learn. I've always wanted to be the best I can be. You know, people get frustrated with me at times because people reach out to me and ask me a million questions, but I can't give them the actual definitive answer because I am not working their dog. Yeah. Um, I can only guide you to understanding the more or less, or understanding all the fundamentals about conditioning, or understanding different things that happen, why it works, when it works, and how it works. There you go. You know, 
but that's basically you know what I I do. Um, like I said, it was always between me and the dog. Um, I never had time to talk to dogmen. I never had time to talk to everybody. All I care about was winning, being bringing them the best I can, and never cheating my dog. I always gave 110 percent. It was always between me and the dog, and I stated that in many of my videos because my greatest adversary was not uh, the person that uh, I was going into. My greatest adversary was the dog getting 110 percent. You know, there's a love of the dog and a passion for it. Just stay simple. Keep it simple. If you're not sure of something, figure things out. Listen to these conversations. Go to school boys' pages and listen to all the videos. There are the answers to a lot of things there that you should check. We don't know everything, but if we can teach and educate people, this is what we do. We love it. Um, I love it. This was my forte. This is all I cared about. Um, don't ask me about breedings. Don't ask me about history. Uh, nothing. All all I cared about was that this animal is going to be the best at his ability. To yeah. me, it was everything. The dog. Yeah. That's the um, part. I want to thank you all for the, being on this page and, I, and listening to this conversation. It's great to come back on. Um, enjoy this topic up more or less, and I hope that it can give you an insight to think about what's going on. And I'm going to thank Schoolboy for making this possible because there's not many like him in this realm of the dog world that are willing to go this far. And and it's because of him everything is made possible, and I thank him from the bottom of my heart for all this. You're welcome, brother. And thank you for helping me out. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll do this again. We still have some some questions but that just means we get to do another video so we'll have another one soon i'm gonna go on vacation this week after i come back i'll give you a holler and we'll we'll set it up again but again thank you thank you for helping Sounds good. make all this possible we'll talk soon night brother. folks thank you